The Mountain Meadows Massacre by Mark Twain The persecutions which the Mormons suffered so long, in which they considered they still suffer in not being allowed to govern themselves, they have endeavored and still are endeavoring to repay. The now almost forgotten Mountain Meadows Massacre was their work. It was very famous in its day. The whole United States rang with its horrors. A few items will refresh the reader's memory. A great emigrant train from Missouri and Arkansas passed through Salt Lake City, and a few disaffected Mormons joined it for the sake of the strong protection it afforded for their escape. In that matter lay sufficient cause for hot retaliation by the Mormon chiefs. Besides these 145 and 150 unsuspecting emigrants, being in part from Arkansas, where a noted Mormon missionary they lately been killed, had lately been killed, and in part from Missouri, a state remembered with execrations as a bitter persecutor of the saints, when they were few and poor and friendless, here were substantial additional grounds for lack of love for these wayfarers. And finally, this train was very rich, very rich in cattle, horses, mules, and other property. And how could the Mormons consistently keep up their coveted res resemblance to the Israelite tribes and not seize the spoil of an enemy when the Lord had so manifestly delivered it into their hand? Wherefore, according to Mrs. Z. V. Waite's entertaining book, The Mormon Prophet, it transpired that a revelation from Brigham Young as great grant archie or God was dispatched to President J. C. Haight, Bishop Higby, and J. D. Lee, the adopted son of Brigham, commanding them to raise all the forces they could muster and trust, follow these cursed Gentiles, so read the revelation, attack them disguised as Indians, and with the arrows of the Almighty make a clean sweep of them, and leave none to tell the tale. And if they needed any assistance, they were commanded to hire the Indians as their allies, promising them a share of the booty. They were to be neither slothful nor negligent in their duty, and be to be punctual in sending the teams back to him before winter set in, but this was a mandate of Almighty God. The command of the revelation was faithfully obeyed. A large party of Indians, painted and tricked out as Indians, overtook the train of emigrant, emigrant trains some 300 miles south of Salt Lake City and made an attack. But the emigrants threw up earthworks, made fortresses of their wagons, and defeated, defended themselves gallantly and successfully for five days. Your Missouri or Arkansas gentleman is not much afraid of the sort of scurvy apologies for Indians which the southern part of Utah affords. He would stand up and fight five hundred of them. At the end of the five days, the Mormons tried military strategy. They retired to the upper end of the meadows, resumed civilized apparel, washed off their paint, and then, heavily armed, drove down into the wagons to the beleaguered emigrants bearing a flag of truce. When the emigrants saw white men coming, they threw down their guns and welcomed them with cheer after cheer and, all unconscious of the poetry of it, no doubt, they lifted a little child aloft, dressed in white, and answered it to the flag of truce. The leaders of the timely white deliverers were President Haight and Bishop John D. Lee of the Mormon Church. Mr. Cradlebaugh, who served as the term of the federal judge in Utah and afterward was sent to Congress from Utah, tells in a speech delivered in Congress how these leaders next proceeded. Quote, they pro professed to be on good terms with the Indians and represented them as being very mad. They also proposed to intercede and settle the matter with the Indians. After several hours parley, they, having apparently visited the Indians, gave the ultimatum of the savages, which was that the emigrants should march out of their camp, leaving everything behind them, even their guns. It was promised by the Mormon bishops that they would bring a force and guard the emigrants back to the settlements. The terms were agreed to, the emigrants being desirous of saving the lives of their families. 
the Mormons retired and subsequently appeared with thirty or forty armed men. The emigrants were marched out, the women and children in front of the men behind, the Mormon guard being in the rear. When they marched in this way about a mile, at a given signal, the slaughter commenced. The men were almost all shot down at the first fire from the guard. Two only escaped, who fled to the desert and were followed 150 miles before they were overtaken and slaughtered. The women and children ran on two or three hundred yards further when they were overtaken with the aid of the Indians they were slaughtered. Seventeen individuals only of all the emigrant party were spared, and they were little children, the eldest of the, them being only seven years old. Thus, on the tenth day of September, 1857, was consummated one of the most cruel, cowardly, and bloody murders known in our history. The number of persons butchered by the Mormons on this occasion was 120. With unheard of temerity, Judge Cradlebaugh opened his court and proceeded to make Mormondom answer for the massacre. And what a spectacle it must have seen, been to see this grim veteran, solitary and alone in his pride and his pluck, glowering down on his Mormon jury and Mormon auditory, deriding them by turns and by turns, breathing threatenings and slaughter. An editorial in the Territorial Enterprise of that day says of him on, on, and of that occasion, he spoke and acted with the fearlessness and resolution of a Jackson. But the jury failed to indict or even report on the charges, while threats of violence were heard in every quarter, an attack on the U.S. troops intimated if he persisted in his course. Quote, Finding that nothing could be done with the juries, they were discharged, with a scathing rebuke from the judge, and then, sitting as a com committing magistrate, he commenced his task alone. He examined witnesses, made arrests in every quarter, and created a consternation in the camps of the saints greater than they had ever witnessed before since Mormondon was born. At last accounts, terrified elders and bishops were decamping to save their necks, and the developments of the most startling character were being made, Implication, implicating the highest church dignitaries with the many murders and robberies committed upon the Gentiles during the past eight years." Unquote. Had Harney been governor, Cradle Bob would have been supported in his work, and the absolute proofs adduced to him by him of Mormon guilt in this massacre and in a number of previous murders would have conferred gratuitous coffins upon certain citizens, together with occasion to use them. But Cumming was the federal governor, and he, under the curious pretense of impartiality, sought to screen the Mormons from the demands of justice. On one occasion he even went so far as to publish his protest against the use of U.S. troops in aid of Cradlebaugh's proceedings. Mrs. C. V. Waite closes her interesting detail of the great massacre and the following remark, with the following remark, an accompanying summary of the testimony, and the summary is concise, accurate, and reliable. Quote, for the benefit of those who may still be deposed to doubt the guilt of Young and his Mormons, in this transaction and the testimony is here collated in circumstances, circumstances given to which go not merely to implicate, but to fasten conviction upon them by confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ. 1. The evidence of Mormons themselves engaged in the affair as shown by the statements of Judge Cradlebaugh and Deputy U.S. Marshal Rogers. 2. The failure of Brigham Young to embody any account of it in his report as superintendent of Indian Affairs, and also his failure to make any allusion to it, whether from the pulpit until several years after the occurrence. 3. The flight of the mountains of men high in authority in the Mormon Church and State when this affair was brought to the ordeal of a judicial investigation. 4. The failure of the Deseret News, the church organ, and the only paper then published in the territory, to notice the massacre until several months afterward, and then only to deny that Mormons were engaged in it. 5. The testimony of the children saved from the massacre. 6. The children and the property of the emigrants found in possession of the Mormons, and that possession traced back to the very day after the massacre. 7. 
The statements of Indians in the neighborhood of the scene of the massacre. These statements are shown not only by Cradlebaugh and Rogers, but by a number of military officers, and by J. Forney, who was, in 1859, superintendent of Indian affairs for the territory. To all these were such statements freely and frequently made by the Indians. 8. The testimony of R. P. Campbell, Captain Second Dragoons, who was sent in the spring of 1859 to Santa Clara to protect travelers on the road to California and to inquire into Indian depredations. Unquote.